this is KBYP after doing the bounce modulator and changing the some of the power supply voltages to the bounce modulator amplifier to V4 mixer and V6 PA driver and also V6 is connected to V7 so same for V7 and for V3 because they're in pairs is necessary to do a total realignment. This radio is very difficult to align correctly and requires understanding circuit theory. This mixer and that PA driver use tune plate tune grid coupling. There are three types of coupling. Resistive, this tune plate tune grid where there's a parallel resonant circuit with these coils and these transformers and these capacitors around these switches. And then there's transformer coupled, such as in the IF T12. But with transformer coupled, these are also tune plate tune grid. These are not are not band pass coupled. That was later technology. Two pieces of circuit theory you must understand to be able to align this radio correctly. Firstly, tubes and transistors have an internal resistance. The tube has a plate resistance. That resistance must match the resistance or incorrectly put the resistive impedance of this parallel network looking into the grid of the next stage. And that only happens at one setting of the inductor and one setting of the capacitor in a parallel resonant circuit. Uh, this is prominent in crystal theory where the where the idea of LC ratio is important. In the Drake manual, it's stated that the RF tune control must be set at either five or seven. It must be set at exactly five or seven to get exactly the right capacitance on the air variable inside. Because for a given set of bias conditions on that tube, only one setting of that capacitor is correct. Many different capacitances and many different inductances can be resonant, but they will not be impedance matched and won't get maximum power transfer. And these stages, these interstages are set, are aligned for, for uh, maximum voltage. These, are, uh, these grids are voltage driven. When I change the bias on these tubes <clears throat> by putting before this resistor, by putting a 220 ohm resistor and a 100 microfarad capacitor, I drop the plate voltages on these tubes by about 15 volts. It threw all of this out of alignment badly. So very, very important to understand that. And here's an example of just how touchy it is. I'll be turning the RF tune. Here's the receive AGC voltage. Watch if I just barely bump the control. See the tens of millivolts dropping off? That's got to be adjusted so it's at a peak. And that's part of the, that's the procedure for first tuning in the receiver and then tuning the transmitter. That was only moved this far. So little you may not be able to see it in the video, but that much is critical. Again, these are not bandpass coupled. They're resonant, and the resonance is at a peak at a single frequency and very touchy. There are alignment steps in the TR3 and TR4 manual. They must be followed in order. Don't get them out of order because one adjustment is dependent on the adjustments before them. To save space in a radio, Drake reused windings in these transformers T6 or T7, 8, 9, and 10. For successive bands, they throw windings in, in uh, parallel. As the bands go up, they put them in parallel. So it is mandatory to start alignment on these transformers, for example, on 80 meters, then work up to 10 because it will not work any other way because the higher bands are dependent on the 80 meter coil settings. For initial alignment of the local oscillators, the VFO, there are some separate steps for the VFO and for the injection transformers. For all this over here, the injection couplers and the VFO transformers, T4, 
it's necessary to put a, uh, a load across them. That's described in the manual. Absolutely must be done. Do not listen to people that say it isn't. They don't know more than Drake. For the early stages before transmit and the V4 mixer and the final and the final driver, the indicator for whether these circuits are peaked is the negative DC voltage. Right in there on the 220 meg ohm resistor for the receive AGC. And that is found at V11 right there. There's a 220 k ohm resistor, easy to get to. Connect a high impedance, high resistance meter to that point. That's the receive AGC from over here at V13A. So that's the, that's this line right here. That is a very sensitive indication of alignment. Uh, first step, adjust the T11 and T12 for the receive IF for peak. That is done with a so-called diddle stick. That's a plastic tube with a steel insert, which centers the plastic tube on the adjustment stem, and then the steel insert goes down in the slot and allows turning. Turn them slowly and carefully. Adjust both, all four slugs on T11 and T12 for maximum reading on the meter. It is impossible to tap into the crystal oscillator in any manner, even with the inductive coupling, and not throw it off frequency. It is important that with old crystals to align the oscillator for maximum output, not exact frequency. Because if the output isn't maximum, then the output from the VFO and the local oscillator mixed together into the mixer here at T6 may be weak. And if that doesn't work, then the crystals have to be replaced. But these crystals have fine output. But again, measure the receive AGC and, tur and tune uh, the uh, inductors, the three, uh, the three cores there. On the other side of the chassis, there are three brass stems coming up, but adjust them for peak. Also, adjust them for center. Turn them one direction until the oscillator clenches and you lose receive signal. Note where that is. Tune it clear to the other direction until it clenches and then set in the middle and try that. That should be close to peak. Even trying to loosely couple an inductor around the plate is going to throw that oscillator off frequency a little. It is vital to use the adjustment fixture here on the plate of V1 pin 6. And on, I think it's pin 9 at the 220 ohm for V3, which is the uh, uh, cathode follower buffer amplifier. This point right here is after the mixing or not of the VFO and the crystals. And on, uh, on uh, 80 and 20, there's no crystal. It's just the uh, VFO right here. But these three transformers with six slugs must be adjusted in an exact order. Follow the order in the manual exactly, but tune them to a peak in the AGC voltage because what that does is maximizes the signal from the mixer. So there are two mixers here, but it's a single conversion. V1 is a mixer for the VFO and local oscillator. And at T6 in the V4 is a second mixer. That will pretty much get the oscillators <clears throat> and the receiver dialed in. The transmitter is a different story. It's possible to use similar procedures to line the transmitter, but it will not work. V3 is in the receiver. V4 is in the transmitter. They have different plate capacitances. They're not the same tube in the same location. So the alignment on these critical parallel resonant circuits will not be the same if it's aligned and receive and then go to transmit and it makes a big difference in transmit power. So after that's done, it's except for the receive IF, it's all got to be redone in transmit. But presetting this in receive saves a lot of time of heating the finals. And for some transmitter alignment, I'll check right here at C61. Go, going to the final grids with the with no filament power on the finals and I'll pre-align the transmitter get it close and receive because it's easy then redo it 
with the scope connected here because that's a high level signal. Then redo it, including all these starting at 80, 40, 20, 10, then 15. Because the 15 meter alignment here is based on the 10 meter. And then it's got to be done under final power to get it exactly right. So it basically has to be done three times. Otherwise, you will not get the correct results. If the radio was new, it wouldn't be necessary to do all that, but it isn't, and it is what it is. And if you don't do it that way, it will not be right. The transmit power might be off 40 watts. Makes a huge difference because, again, these are aligned to peak. And they're sharp, and they're touchy, and they got to be exact. Just having no power on the finals makes a big change on the grid impedance and affects that circuit and that circuit and transmit and receive. These are all coupled together all the way back to the VFO. Of course, making a change in the grid of the final may not make any noticeable difference in the VFO, but in theory, it's all coupled together. Once that's done, the transmitter output should be at least 150 watts CW. Then for the sideband system, the carrier needs to be a bit out of the filter pass band. I've gone through in other videos replacing the, the diode bridge. That's a must. T14 is adjusted for a peak in the power. This should all be adjusted with no filament voltage on the final because it takes a lot of tweaking by measuring the RF voltage at C61. And that voltage can be detuned by throwing the RF tune off. But the T13, the transformer in transmit going into the sideband filter, which is there, and T6 coming out must be sweep aligned. There's no way around it. And I have another video on my channel showing some of that. But basically got a sweep into the microphone jack right there. Oh, I use a 100 to 3000 cycle sweep tone at 50 milliseconds repetition rate. Synchronize the oscilloscope to that. Read the RF envelope at the final grids back under there. And you'll see the two yellow capacitors for the 500 picofarad. I put two 1000s in series, and that gives a center point, which is isolated to DC. So when measuring in between the two, an accidental short and a meter lead can't, can't fry the final twos because they lost grid voltage. And notice the restoration and modification work I've done. This is the this is the marker oscillator, original marker oscillator, original crystal in this rig. It's reading 40 over. Usually, it's down down about here. So the work I've done has picked up 20 dB sensitivity in the receiver, which is phenomenal. I can hear I can hear a mouse fart in Europe on on 40 meters. The most critical thing in a transmitter is to get the RF tune control set to exactly the right position. And that's exactly seven and exactly five. Adjust for each band the correct slugs on T7, 8, 9, and 10. But that's not good enough. Then you got to turn the RF tune control just a little bit clockwise and check it again. And then set it a little bit the other side counterclockwise and check it to find the peak because there's no way to tell exactly when that white hash mark is pointing exactly at seven because there's no hash mark on the faceplate. So you got to not only get a peak, but it's got to be exactly the right peak at exactly the right capacitance. So you got to, you got to jerk that RF tune capacitor either side for each band and get the absolute maximum peak or the transmitter output will suffer. It's that critical. And if you think that's bad, try aligning all those slugs in the R4A and R4B. It'll make you jump off a bridge. With regard to the carrier balance, see my balance modulator videos. It is not permitted 
to adjust the carrier balance to tune out the carrier regardless of what the manual says. That balance control is there to put exactly the same voltages on top and bottom of that bridge and if it's wrong the bridge is bad. Do not try to adjust that carrier balance control. That's wrong. If you have to adjust it, the thing is broke. Replace the bridge and the resistors. C168 is a piston trimmer for the balance modulator amp. That's tweaked to minimize the audio response in the speaker in receive <clears throat> by turning the transmitter gain all the way up and talking in a micro tapping on it. There is carrier leakage through this circuit through V15 even though the cathode of V15 is biased at 150 volts backwards. There's still capacitive coupling through this circuit into T13 into V11 and that's how that the microphone signal can be heard in the receiver in receive. So that is a sort of a neutralizing adjustment to get rid of most of that. I put a mute <laughs> relay here to ground the grid of V15 when it's in receive so that that doesn't come through anymore and with the new bounce modulator improvements that shouldn't be necessary because there shouldn't be any carrier leakage. Trying this for the first time prepare to spend two days at it it's that difficult. I can do it in a half hour now because I've done it a hundred times literally. I've adjusted some of these cams so much that the screws are loose trying to fall out but it is a very difficult procedure to get right. And if it ain't difficult, you didn't do it right, you know, either get the maximum receive or maximum transmit, but not both. <clears throat> and in the end result, we're looking for maximum transmitter output, not receive. Because maximum receive, I mean, this receiver is plenty sensitive enough on the order of half microvolt. It's got plenty of receive sensitivity. It doesn't need any more of that. When initially working on starting to restore these rigs, don't fall for the temptation of turning the slugs. That's a very bad thing to do because that will cause you to lose the original position. And unless the radio is completely restored and working exactly correctly, the positions will be off. So if initially you start turning things before the radio is working correctly, they'll be turned way off. And on 10 meters, it's really difficult to get the transmitter to respond. Turn uh, the uh, slugs for uh, these transformers on 10 meters off and you'll think they'll never come back. It's hard to find and you can't do it in receive. The marker oscillator can be used to put a tone through on receive, <clears throat> but its output drops badly from 20 meters on up. So it's just about useless on 15 and 10. For initial alignment on 10, use an external generator. Get a good S9 signal and, and peak these uh, transformers for 10. <clears throat> and be absolutely guaranteed that not only one would be right on 10, but it may be so far off, there's no 10 meter transmit. So don't be surprised when you uh, land on 10 and the final doesn't seem to work. If the final stage works on 40, it'll work on 10. The neutralization is critical. The instructions are to get it working on 10 and to adjust neutralization on 10. But if the neutralization is off, the transmitter won't work on 10 meters, so you're stuck. <clears throat> neutralization has an effect on 40 meters. This is more than just the neutralization. This capacitor, this wiring, all this is a I mean, that wire from, from here over to here is not a wire. It is part of a tuned network, an impedance matching network. And there's a feedback from the plates of the finals back to the final driver that is active on all bands. It won't have much effect on 80, but if you're completely out in the weeds, neutralize it on 40. Do not attempt to neutralize it cold. There is no such thing. That's a myth. 40 meter transmit, <clears throat> adjust neutralizing capacitor until the plate current dip and the power output maximum are at the same position when the 
plate control is turned and it's difficult to do but you got to watch the um, plate current meter for a dip <clears throat> and power output max go from 40 then up to 20 meters and do it on 20 and that will start that will start homing in that that neutralization capacitor then go up to 10 and get it right but it can be far enough off that you cannot get it to neutralize on 10 because it can be so far off that there's improper feedback that the transmitter doesn't work on 10 meters it's taken me 20 minutes to describe this process to you it will take you all day if you're lucky the first few times to do it so be prepared but again if you don't do it this way it will never be right okay byp out